Hi, I'm your host, Dave Kemp, and this is Future Ear Radio. Each episode, we're breaking down one new thing, one cool new finding that's happening in the world of hearables, the world of voice technology. How are these worlds starting to intersect? How are these worlds starting to collide? What cool things are going to come from this intersection of technology? Without further ado, let's get on with the show. Okay, everyone, and welcome to another episode of the Future Ear Radio Podcast. I'm really looking forward to this conversation today with Liz Femler. Liz, welcome to the podcast. Tell us a little bit about who you are and what you do. So my name is Liz Femler. I am a vestibular audiologist. I practice in Kansas City, Missouri in a private practice, and I'm originally from Missouri, so born and raised here, went to school, undergrad here. Um, I got my doctorate at Purdue University in Indiana. And then I catapulted to Phoenix for my externship at Mayo Clinic and came back to good old Missouri. (laughs) Good old Missouri. Well, two Missouriites. I know. Missourian nights on the podcast. Whatever we're called. (laughs) (laughs) Whatever we're called. And uh, oddly enough, like just crazy small world circumstances, you went to undergrad at Truman University, which is where my wife went. So you fellow bulldogs, um, which is just, again, just small world type thing. But um, it is. Helps me trust you a little bit more. (laughs) So I do appreciate that. (laughs) Um, Well, I wanted to have you on, you know, for people that have been like listening to the podcast for a long time, they might know that before Future Ear, I actually was doing Oak Tree TV and you were a guest on Oak Tree TV. Mm -hmm. So you've been like one of truly one of the long time guests that I've had on. Um, And so thought that, you know, we ran into each other at AAA uh, in St. Louis here. And, um, you know, it was great to catch up with you. And definitely, uh, as we were talking, I was like, oh, man, I really want to bring you back on the podcast, because there's so many different things that you're doing that's so interesting. So um, wanted to just kind of set the stage, though, and talk about, you know, how, you came into the world of vestibular. So um, I know that you also were the president of the Student Academy of Audiology during your time there. So we can touch on that too. But if you wouldn't mind maybe sharing, how did you uh, come into audiology to begin with and then let alone specialize on the vestibular side of things? Yeah. So coming into audiology, I really didn't know what I wanted to major in in undergrad, Uh, but I did have a really cool summer job on Catalina Island, which is off the coast of LA for three years. And I worked at a scuba diving camp and oddly enough, and Missouri people may not know this because we're not surrounded by water, but to get your (laughs) scuba diving certification, you have to learn the full anatomy of the ear because there's a lot of ear related pressure changes that you have to be aware of and have to compensate for as you're diving deeper. And I thought this was fascinating. Um, I had taken one intro to communication disorders class where they just touched on the ear for like five seconds. And I feel like that's when really I became interested in the anatomy of the ear. It's super complex and has a lot of function. So that was the first thing that drew me in was scuba diving. I was convinced I was going to be a scuba diving audiologist, which is again, very hard in Missouri. Um, as far as vestibular. So I talk about this a lot with students who come through our clinic, but for a longest time, even up until almost graduation, I wanted to be a generalist. I wanted to see every single part of audiology. I wanted to be good at everything. And I think the more I started to learn about different subsets of the field, the less I wanted to be a generalist. So, you know, in the last few months of my externship, I realized that I actually wanted to be a specialist because when you think about it from the patient perspective, who do they want to see? Do they want to see a generalist or a specialist? And I know who I would want to see. And so I think you know, I just determined that in order to be the best professional, I really should just dive into one subject set and get really, really good at it so that I could provide the best care for my patients. And so that patients would seek me out as the specialist, um, for vestibular in particular. Um, I did not like vestibular going into grad school. It was not a subject that I was interested in. Um, I always describe it as a Plinko type situation. If you've seen Plinko on Price is Right, but I kept getting directed into different vestibular experiences. And at a certain point I had way too much experience to say no to a future in vestibular. So I, I feel like that's more accredited to my mentors than to any of my own efforts. Yeah, that's awesome. Um, lots that I want to touch on there. Uh, 
actually just a quick side note when we had our christmas party this year we we actually built our own <clears throat> plinko board oh that's and amazing. and so everybody got to go and put a couple pucks in and go down the the plinko board so plinko's amazing for it is a fun game no um, until it goes where you don't want it to go and then you're like no that's yeah. how i was with vestibular i was like wait <laughs> where am i going i didn't know either that is a scuba diving audiologist is that really a thing I don't think so, but maybe that'll be my next specialty. I just noticed there's a lot of ear related injuries due to pressure problems as you're scuba diving. And I'm like, who do these people go to? I don't know. I I still don't know. (laughs) I could totally imagine that being a thing. Um, Okay. So you started to, so you you said you didn't originally like vestibular, but then you decided you kind of got pulled in that direction. (laughs) When did you fall in love with the vestibular or or at least where do you stand today with your love for vestibular audiology? Anyone that has ever done vestibular knows that you may never hundred <laughs> percent love it. Um, and that may be true with every subset, but it's a really challenging field. And I don't know if I'll ever be at the point of loving it. I think there's days that you'd absolutely love it, but I think it challenges me more than anything. Um, I think for my personality, I I'm like a puzzle piece putter together. And I think vestibular was a really, really good subset for that aspect. And honestly, diagnostics in general are really good for problem solvers or people who are seeking solutions because we can use all these different test results and try to put it together in the context of that patient. So, you know, I think for me, it really benefits to focus in that vestibular aspect because it is so puzzle driven. Yeah. And I was going to say too, like, I think with vestibular, it seems like you've really specialized too, even so like a niche within the niche. Um, and when we were talking in St. Louis, you were saying, and I've seen some of the stuff that you've been um, publishing and, and doing talks about, but like largely around concussions. Yeah. Um, so I wanted to just get into that a little bit too, because I think that, you know, on the surface for someone like me, that's not as like well-versed and immersed into all the different, um, you know, nooks and crannies of audiology, I would have just thought like vestibular is sort of, it encapsulates like a handful of different things. But as I've started to kind of learn more, it seems like it's actually quite robust with all the different tangents and and different fields or subdomains within it. So can you Mm -hmm. tell me a little bit about how you got into that side of the vestibular audiology. So I was super, super lucky to work with a vestibular audiologist named Jamie Bogle, who's at Mayo Clinic in Arizona. And she is one of a few professionals that are on a concussion management team at Mayo. And they actually started a clinic that's called the Return to Play Clinic. And it's super interesting. It's a neurologist, it's an audiologist and it's a neuropsychologist that see people. And I thought that was fascinating that audiology is like right there with neurology, evaluating concussion on the front line. And then they send them out to therapy and they keep coming back for reevaluations. And it, the audiologist was the main person with that. So that's where I got experience in how potential vestibular reflexes and vestibular pathways can be impacted post head injury. Um, when I accepted the job in this private practice that I'm currently in, I started a concussion program, which was kind of difficult actually looking back, um, as a new grad, especially since I didn't totally know what I was doing at the the forefront of it. I took Mayo Clinic's protocol and did my own research and trying to expand and just learn and test what works well with patients. But, you know, that's been a really, really amazing subset. We've grown, I see probably five out of my 15 vestibular patients are concussion a week, which is an unreal volume. Um, I have connections with the neurologists around Kansas city who see post head injury, but it was, you know, I've learned so much, not only just being in the concussion subset, cause that's like, there's very, very, very few people in the nation doing it. Um, but also just from a aspect of starting a new program, like what it takes from physician marketing to protocol development, to mentorship and research. And, um, it's been really great for me personally. And it's been awesome because my patients are actually seeing benefit to my evaluation, which is the most important. So let's unpack a little bit of this. So I find this really cool how you're like, um, you know, audiology is on the same level as neurology Mm -hmm. with the concussion protocol. Like what, how, how do the two, uh, how are the two sort of like delineated? Like what's the role of the audiologist within the concussion protocol? 
Yeah. So typically how I describe it to physicians or neurologists that are sending to me is I look at eye related and ear related reflexes and muscle pathways to see where the breakdown occurs or in what situation a patient has symptoms. So so what's interesting about, and where I think vestibular audiologists have the greatest benefit in today's world is we have equipment that allows us to be super objective about what the abnormality is and is that normal for their age? So for example, if someone were to send a 70 year old who had a fall and hit their head to me, I could tell you if a specific eye movement is normal for their age or not. So therefore is a result of the recent head injury or not. And I think that is super beneficial information to neurology. Most of the time, neurologists do bedside assessments and same with our physical therapy colleagues. A lot of them do bedside assessments. They're using their eyes to look at your eyes. With our equipment that really only vestibular audiologists have, we have standardized stimulus, we've got objective measures, and we have age-based norms that allow us to say, how normal is this for your age and for your particular situation? And then we help interpret that for the neurologist and measure progress throughout their recovery. I think, you know, there's two really big challenges in the field of concussion where I think vestibular audiology is going to really come in as a big benefit. Number one is just identifying whether a concussion has occurred because there's actually no one test that can say, yes, this person's had a concussion or no, they haven't. It's all based on symptoms, which is really challenging for a lot of patients to describe. The other thing is A lot of neurologists don't know when it's safe to discharge a patient back to work, back to the soccer field. And so when we can use physiologic data, that's really concrete. We're able to say, Hey, things are hundred percent back to normal physiologically and they feel asymptomatic. So things are looking good. And that gives the neurologist a lot of, you know, peace of mind that they're not putting them into a dangerous situation. So is this relatively new where audiology has, uh, I guess, been like brought to the table, um, within this whole concussion protocol discussion, or has this been ongoing and it's just been something where there's only a finite amount of people that's been doing it. Um, so just help, kind of help me yeah. understand how long has this even been part of the scope of audiology is the question I guess I'm asking. Yeah, I'd say uh, you're at the forefront by asking that question right now. So there's not a lot of research in vestibular audiology about concussion and concussion is super interesting. So, you know, in the last 10 years, you've probably even noticed that there's been a lot more focus on concussions. There was that big NFL study. People get really worried about having concussions all of a sudden. When we were kids, we like hit our head all the time. It didn't even matter. Uh, But now there's been increased focus on that. Um, there's a lot of people who have their hands in play in concussion and historically it's been physical therapists, athletic trainers, and primary care physicians and neurologists. I just think, I think this is a huge opportunity for vestibular because of the tools that we have and the training that we have. And I mean, I know for a fact, I'm one person that needs to start publishing a lot of the data that I'm seeing because there's not a lot of people doing what I do. And there's not a lot of research published on what how we can be of benefit. So that's one of my goals in my spare time, but I'd say we are in the forefront of the beginning of this. It's not very common. It's obviously really exciting when we're, you know, I I was talking to you before we started recording and I said like, you know, one of the most exciting things about doing this podcast is I really do get to get a finger on the pulse of like, where the whole field of science is moving in Mm -hmm. these new directions. And I think that you know, as has been the theme on the podcast is like, we kind of all, I think are coming to the agreement that, uh, the, the profession of audiology needs to diversify away from just hearing aid sales. I think that's still like going to obviously play a role, but there's lots and lots of new opportunities. And this is just another one of those areas Mm -hmm. that, you know, is really starting to expand and become more of a a focal point, I think, for the profession. So when you're saying, okay, I need to start publishing some of this data, like, I guess, can you sort of sum up some of the things that you're seeing without, I guess, spoiling any future publications that you're going to put out? But I'm just really curious to like hear when you say we have all this special equipment that we use, and we're starting to compile all this data, like broad strokes, what are some of the things that you're seeing that you're like, it gets you excited about this work and the longevity of like, there's a lot of legs here and we as a profession need to start to kind of throw our weight collectively behind this. Yeah. So one of the, 
one publication that's in process uh, right now, so it'll be the first one that everybody sees and I've presented on it, is on an eye movement that's called the anti saccade eye movement test. And this is actually, the test has been around for a while, and there's a lot of chiropractors, functional neurologists that have been using this for a long time. Um, but really with how much we look at the eyes, it could be in our domain very easily. So we just finished collecting normative data for micromedical and acoustic sy system, uh, which will be implemented this fall. And everyone already has access to the anti saccade module, but it's been really, really sensitive to identifying acute post head injury cases. So that's one example of, you know, something to look out for something called the anti saccade. There's a lot of different balance, specific balance patterns, rotary chair patterns. Um, other ocular motor eye related deficits that are very patterned. Some of these are consistent with previously what's been reported on the quote unquote bedside from physical therapy literature, and some of it's new. So honestly, there's just so much to cover with different subsets of what I'm finding. But I, I do think, um, you know, I've got some resources I can share about where I've talked about these different findings already. And I think we'll be touching on one of those subsets later, but I have a lot of resources that if people are interested in, they can dive a little bit deeper. So, uh, you had mentioned like you're seeing the Kansas city chiefs, right? You have like football players coming in and I'm just curious, like, is it a pipeline of just professional athletes or are you seeing kids? Are you seeing just all different walks of life? Like you had mentioned some, maybe some older adults that are, yeah. uh, falls, you know, those kinds of things. So can you just help me understand the type of patients that are coming in. And, and now that I am kind of unpacking what you said earlier, that is pretty crazy that one in three patients that you're seeing in the vestibular realm yeah. is a concussion patient. So it does seem like there's, um, you're like, we're just tapping into something that's yeah. really, really big here. Yeah. And like I said, I'm just in Kansas city, Missouri. So, you know, think <laughs> about some of these bigger metros that yeah. the opportunity is huge. So causes of head injuries range, you know, in an ages range. So I see typically ages eight to 90 is probably what I see. It's all across the spectrum. I'd like to get more into the pediatric realm. Cause that's obviously where a lot of head injuries are happening, but top causes of falls are motor vehicle accidents, falls and sport related concussions. Um, I'd say older adults tend to obviously be falls and it's possible they were already at risk for a fall and that's why they had their head injury. So it's kind of like, which came first, the, the balance problem or the head injury. Um, so there's, there's a lot of different opportunity, but I'd say every single concussion patient is so incredibly unique from age to how they present with their head injury that it's just, it keeps things exciting and interesting. Yeah, I think uh, it's just really neat to hear like how much opportunity there is here. And uh, so changing gears a little bit, mm -hmm. um, you had alluded to it just a minute ago, but uh, you know, one of these resources that I know that you're sharing a lot of this information is with your podcast, A Dose yep. of Dizzy. Is it A Dose of Dizzy or A Dose of Dizziness? A Dose of Dizzy. Yeah. A Dose of Dizzy. Okay. So it's you and Daniel, that's your mm -hmm. co-host. Yep. Um, so I want to just give you an opportunity to plug your podcast a little bit and share about like what it is that you do. And before I do though, I, I just want to say, I thought like in your, the, I listened to a couple episodes and I listened to the trailer and you said something that I, that really resonated with me in the trailer, which is like, you know, we're all so busy and I think that, I don't know if it's just millennials or, or really just like all of us today, um, learning via like through auditory, um, ways of, of learning is, is just like more and more conducive to our lives today. Mm -hmm. Uh, you can learn on the go, you can do all this. And so I just think it's really neat how you're, you're kind of like boiling down, some of the key takeaways from all this different research that I think a lot of people would love to take the time to do it, but it's like, you know, it becomes a challenge to find the time. And so if you give people the opportunity to summarize that information through a podcast, um, by summing up some of that so that they can listen on the go, I just find that to be so appealing in this day and age and so conducive, uh, to, to that type of format of like, taking information, boiling it down of these research talks and, 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 and different papers and stuff like that. Um, so good on you on, on the format. Cause I think it's really neat, but just wanted to give you a chance to kind of yeah. share how you even started this, how you and Daniel met and what a dose of dizzy entails for anybody that might be interested in this. For sure. So first of all, I met Daniel through national student Academy of audiology. So you had mentioned before I was on the national board, 
Um, I started as a second year volunteering with the National SA, and I was actually on a committee with Daniel, who was also a student at that time, and we were helping plan the SA conference that happens every year in conjunction with AAA. And we both stayed involved with National um, SA. We both were on the board the year after our volunteering. So the National Board, there's about 10 members that get nominated and voted there. Um, and then I was president my last year of school, but that's how we met. And we just worked really well together. We both were trending towards similar interests. Daniel is an AUD PhD, um, focused completely in vestibular. He's at Vanderbilt now, but we actually, he had this idea during COVID. We had been talking back and forth and I'm fully in the clinic. And at that point he was fully in the research world. And so we tried to stay in touch because he wanted to know what was happening in the clinic. And I wanted to know what's going on with research. I don't have time to read any of that. Um, and so he proposed that maybe we should start a vestibular focused podcast that could discuss what's coming out current research in the vestibular field. And not only to keep us accountable, but maybe other people would be interested as well. And the goal for us, and we say this in our trailer, is we want it to be accessible, but digestible dose of the vestibular research and vestibular topics and super conversation based because, and I'm sure a lot of people feel this way, but the best conversations happen over a beer, you know, talking about what's happening. That's what gets yep. us excited. And so we wanted it to be very conversation based so that you could learn the best about vestibular in the most digestible way. So we've been doing this. This is one of those COVID projects that we actually stuck with, which, you know, not every COVID project you did, <laughs> um, but we're through halfway through our second season. And we have been very shocked at how many people are interested in this subset niche. We've have um, vestibular students, interested students, vestibular audiologists, and a lot of physical therapists that listen to it. And I think, you know, anything and everything learning vestibular wise is so beneficial because there's not a lot of resources at certain programs. Not everybody has great vestibular programs. It's actually more rare to have a good vestibular uh, training. And so we wanted more resources available to students. I also think that it's been really helpful for me being in the clinic to have some sort of something keeping me on track with keeping up with research, because I think that makes me a better clinician and provider for my patients. If I know what's going on and I'm not, I'm a person that's not going to just like go home and read some research articles. That is not my style. So this is a really good way for me to stay in touch with what's going on. And I think that's been the case for people listening is it's way more accessible than sitting down and reading that research. Yeah, I like th this resonates so much with me because um, in many ways, that's kind of what I was doing with the podcast with this podcast initially was, uh, you know, taking information that I was really, I found really interesting and appealing and then trying to just like make it as digestible as possible, knowing mm -hmm. that the the target audience are busy people like that was basically who I was targeting. And I know that that's what you're doing with this, too. And I think that. Um, you know, there's so many different, like once you get going and, and this is just kind of speaking about podcasting, broadly speaking is one of the fears that you have early on. Um, and I don't know if you shared this as well is, am I going to run out of things to talk about, particularly if it's like this small niche thing, mm -hmm. but I feel like as, as you get going, you realize, oh, okay. Like even this one topic, I can break apart into three different things. I could do an in-person interview and I could talk about it with my co-host. And then we could maybe have another thing that's, you know, another spin on that one topic. So it always felt like a fear that was never founded when you actually got going. Um, and so I'd be curious to hear your thoughts on that. Like, did you ever feel like we're going to run out of things to talk about 10 episodes in, or did you feel comfortable that there was plenty of material to cover? I felt pretty comfortable. There was plenty of material, mainly just based on my own lack of knowledge of things that I want <laughs> to learn more about vestibular. I felt pretty confident about that. And the goal is, you know, we want to evolve with research and vestibular. This is still the newest part of audiology. Vestibular research lags way behind auditory research. And so, you know, I, I never scared about running out of things also because Daniel and I are also very talkative. So we could probably talk about nothing for a really long time. Um, more of my concern, I had already done research on how to run a podcast and Daniel is the smart one that edits all of it and makes it sound really good. But I was kind of curious how many people would find benefit to it. And I didn't really care because I found benefit to it. Like I said, it was helpful for me, but um, we've just received way better feedback 
than I thought that we would have. And um, I think our most challenging thing is just keeping consistent with developing episodes just because we both are really busy as well. And we do this just as a hobby. It's not like anything that we're instructed to do. It's just out of our own free time. So that's probably the hardest part, I think. Yeah. I, I mean, consistency is, is like the name of the game with podcasting and content creation in general. And I've noticed that you've recently started bringing on guests, which is always a great way to uh, diversify the Mm -hmm. the episode formats. And, um, you know, I, I feel like one of the things that I've felt when, when I do podcasts, all of mine are with other guests is that, um, the guests, like the great thing about having guests is that they make you just think differently about every single topic. And so Mm -hmm. it, it spurs on future content because, even just something that's said in passing might lead to a totally new subset of content that you can create down the line. So how has this experience been where you're now starting to get into these different formats? I mean, you're in your second season. It looks like you've done uh, probably, I don't know, 20 episodes or 30 Mm -hmm. episodes or something like that. Um, So are you feeling like you guys have uh, you know, even as challenging as it might be to just stay consistent that you're starting to just kind of, find yourself looking to, to change it up and try new things and just diversify it as, as things get going and momentum builds. Yeah. So our first season, our main goal was to go test disorder, test disorder, every other, just to give, you know, kind of the basics of what vestibular is for people that were just tuning in. I feel like this season we're trying to do still the test and disorders, but throwing in that guest speaker we had. Um, I work with a physical therapist who was hired onto our private practice. She's vestibular and concussion. So we had her, that was probably one of our best episodes learning about vestibular rehab. Like I work with her every day and it was until I interviewed her on the podcast that I like learned all these amazing things she does. Because again, it's part of it is just sitting down and asking those questions that we don't have time to ask on a daily basis. So I think having guests, like you said, is just the best way to learn. And you learn things about people that you work with every single day, which is amazing. So I feel like you're uh, really inspiring for, mm, let's call it prospective audiologists or uh, incoming audiologists, some of the young professionals in this field. You're, you know, you have like five years under your belt now, or however many that since you're two and a half. Thank you. Okay. Well, it seems (laughs) so flattering. (laughs) Okay. So you have a few years under your belt. Um, You've started, you know, you started the the concussion, the concussion protocol, but I think like between the podcast and I know you always challenge yourself to go and speak at different events. And, um, I feel like this would be a good opportunity to maybe just kind of speak to that portion of the audience and say like the benefits of you've obviously been thinking this way for a long time, going all the way back to pushing yourself to be involved in the the student Academy of audiology to the point to where you became the president of the student Academy of audiology. Then, you know, you get this job, uh, and you immediately take it upon yourself to develop a new curriculum or a new program, I'm sorry, uh, within the clinic, um, you start a podcast. And, and so I just feel like you're very emblematic of this idea of like pushing yourself out of your comfort zone. And there's clear benefits that you can show of you're probably, you've probably met tons of people. You've opened a lot of doors for yourself just by putting yourself out there. And I feel like part of the challenge for young professionals is like imposter syndrome. You're always worried of like, am I really qualified to talk about this? And am I really qualified to do this and that? And so if anyone can speak to this, I feel like you're really qualified here to just talk through like, did you have that? And how did you battle that? And it seems like you've just incrementally pushed yourself to higher and higher levels. So just to the people that are out there that look up to you, like, what would you say of where to even start in terms of how you did this? Yeah, I, this is challenging because I think, especially in today's world, we're all very, very busy and time is a very precious, precious resource. Um, I always, you know, mention, and I hope that everyone who's entering audiology or is in audiology cares about the future of the profession in general. Um, But I don't think that's always the case. And I, I always encourage students that you should do one thing outside of what you're required to do. 
for the profession, because ultimately we are going to be stronger as a profession. If everybody does one thing outside of what they're required to do, whether as a student or in your professional life. And the good news is everybody has their own unique talents and skill set, So we don't all have to be doing the same things outside of our clinical responsibilities. You know, some people really have benefits to legislation and helping, you know, with state advocacy. That's probably not my like top skill set. Some people are just good about advocating or volunteering in facets that help, you know, tell other people about what audiology is. Some people do research, which is critical, you know, so I think there's a lot of different ways that we can push our profession forward. And why I say that's important is if we aren't pushing our profession forward, our reimbursement's not going to get better. Our pay is not going to get better. Our, you know, acceptance of how primary care sends to our office is not going to get better. You know, all these aspects and challenges that we have on a daily basis, even the insurance woes of like hearing aids not being covered by insurance, like all of this is rooted in what are we doing to, you know, advance the profession outside of your day-to-day job. So I think that's one perspective that I have is I want my job in 10 years to continue to get better. And I don't think if, if I'm not doing something actively to make that happen or make the profession move forward, then, um, you know, I'm not ensuring that for myself. I think as far as the things that I've personally done, the biggest benefits that I've noticed is that I'm a better clinician to my patients when I push myself to learn outside of clinic. And some days are easier than others. Um, You know, like signing up to give talks at conferences is kind of like the best and worst thing all in one because it's stressful and I wait till the last minute. But ultimately, I, the yeah, those things are the best thing though because they push you. Uh, to learn more outside of what you would normally learn. I also think just getting involved and getting in these situations, like you said, I, my network is large. And I think that's really important because you've got mentors and peers that you can rely on for questions or advice that you need to help give best patient care. And then, you know, from like a personal brand aspect, I think it's just important to build your own credibility because that helps, you know, I'm a, first of all, just being a young female doctor, I think is really challenging. And I, I have, I wish this was something that was covered in grad programs. And I always bring it up to students, but like how to respond to patients who don't trust you, who don't think you're qualified enough, who don't think that women should be doctors, you know, whatever you can think of, I've heard. And I think one doing some of those things helps me feel confident telling the patient, like I am a credible and I already told them that, you know, just from going through school and I felt that, but I think that's one thing that's really challenging for young females entering the profession is feeling that credibility. And I think for me, I feel more confidence when I'm learning outside of clinic and pushing myself to do things that give me better credibility to the patient. So I think that's where I've seen the most benefit. Yeah, I couldn't agree more with all that. I I think that um, your whole point too, on like just, you know, forcing yourself to do something is so uh, it's like painful at the time, but it's so (laughs) beneficial. Like you always walk away from it happy that like, you know, I signed up for a talk um, or, you know, for somebody that like, maybe you don't feel like you're quite qualified yet uh, for presenting at even a state chapter. Um, yeah. and, and I would challenge anybody. I would say, I bet you probably are, but look at the podcasting circuit, you know, like it's really starting to merge and emerge mm-hmm. in this industry. There's more and more podcasts coming out. You don't necessarily have to start your own, but I think just like identifying what it is that you're really passionate about. Like it could start with what's the thing that was your grand rounds topic and figure out, okay, so like, uh, this is going to be, you know, I had my poster session was focused on this, this topic. And so find ways to just make a presentation based on that. Start compiling different research, just connect the dots between a few different pieces of research that you're reading and come up with your own spin on it. You don't have to reinvent the wheel, but I think that it, uh, you know, just formulating anything to start with is so important because that's like the, that's how you push the ball down the mountain is Mm -hmm. you got to get it started some way. And then you can just build on everything. So if you, you start off with, I'm going to try, you know, my goal is going to be, I want to, I want to become a guest on one of these podcasts, or I want to be a, I want to have a speaking opportunity at the podium at any in-person show, start Mm -hmm. small, figure out, okay, so I'm going to start with like my Missouri Academy of Audiology or something like that. And 
you know, seek out who is the program director and contact them, you know? And so a lot of this stuff, I think that the takeaway is like, nobody's going to really do it for you. You have to take the initiative to do that. But I think the point, the broader point is like, it's probably a lot easier than you think though, in terms of Mm -hmm. like, you're, you're probably going to be more accepted than you think. Um, There's people are always seeking call for proposals. You know, there's Mm -hmm. always, um, you know, as like an event organizer, they're always looking for these types of things. So you're probably more in demand than you think. And I think that to your point, as soon as you get started and you can kind of use that as your pillar of like, that's your foundational piece, you can start to build your personal brand around that. Like you, that can start to be kind of what your identity is and allow for you to start to use that as your tool of like how you start to network in that circle. And then it just starts to just expand from there. Yeah. I think it's been one thing that I have found very interesting in the last couple, like honestly, the last year or two is the increase in audit audiology related Instagram accounts. I think that has been really awesome. And I think there's a lot of really talented people who are like graphic artists or just really good at that content creation. And like, I run our offices marketing. And so I run our Instagram and frequently I will share, you know, a lot of these awesome graphics that people make or drawings. I'm like, this is so cool because you'll notice if you're spending any time on Instagram, for example, physical therapists are all over it. Chiropractors all over it. They've got videos, they have content and people are sharing and saving. I have a friend who has been a PT and he started an Instagram and has, you know, hundreds of thousands of followers just based on little videos on how, how to help different pain points. And, you know, I think it's really interesting and audiology needs to kind of catch up. And that's where young professionals are going to be the most beneficial is in the podcasting domain, the TikTok. you know, that's been huge for audiology in Instagram. Cause those are the things that are capturing our new target market for audiology that needs to get to our practice. You know, those younger people. I could not agree more. I actually, the episode I just published today, um, I had uh, Dr. Michelle who on, who has the mama who hears Instagram account. And the thing that gets me so excited about this uh, it's her and, you know, listen with Lindsay or it's um, you know, what you're doing. And uh, just like one of the coolest things about today's day and age um, is the outsized impact that one person can make, like Mm -hmm. your one page alone could be like, when I was talking with Michelle, she has like thousands of these deaf or hard of hearing individuals or the loved ones of the individuals, like Mm -hmm. parents or whoever it might be. And there, she is seeing, you know, 10 to 12 patients a day in her clinic, but she's really seeing like thousands of people a day yeah. in, in a sense, because so many people are coming onto her page, asking all of these different questions. So she's becoming one of the default resources that people turn to when, you know, like the program that she's put together of like, my child has hearing loss now what? And I think that I could not agree more with you that this is where you can really start to play to your strengths is like, yep. you know, taking these things that we have um, been told as a toy and, <laughs> and finding a way to actually make it really effective and meaningful in a professional setting. So that if you're, if you have really good, like chops on Instagram, use it, figure out a way to, if you're working in a clinic, like see if maybe that's an opportunity as you can take over their um, social feed, or at least mm-hmm. kind of show a proof of work of like, this is what I would want to do with it. And you can create all kinds of campaigns that way. So mm-hmm. there's so much that I think um, plays to the strengths of young professionals today, but yep. it's a matter again of like, you got to just do it and put yourself out there and not just assume that like something is somehow going to magically happen where it's going to just present itself to you. These things always come from you taking the initiative and kind of being a little bit uncomfortable, but we grow when we're outside of our comfort zones, I feel like. Yeah. I feel like the hardest thing, cause I, you know, talk to quite a few students and guest lecture. And one thing I always touch on is student involvement. And I think it's really hard because, you know, in high school, you're doing all these extracurriculars to get into college. Same thing with college. You're doing all this extra stuff to get into grad school. And by the time we reach grad school, you're just trying to get a job. So, you know, maybe you're doing that's what you have to do, but it's a little bit of a different feel, you know, it's not the big rush to do everything you possibly can to distinguish a resume. It's just a little different. Um, so I feel like a lot of times students will say, why, like, what is in it for me to do something outside of what I'm required to do? And I think that's challenging to answer, you know, and hopefully you'll realize that when you do something 
out of your responsibilities, what you give, you will get back tenfold. You know, it's kind of this maybe weird karma thing, but like the more you're able to serve the profession, you really are going to benefit in knowledge, increased knowledge, increased resources, increased support, you know, increased credibility, whatever you're looking for, you're probably going to get it. Uh, And maybe you don't see that in the opportunity that is presenting before you, but I always encourage, you know, someone to say yes, even if it's something just outside of your program at your university or in your community or state national, you know, whatever, just say yes, you don't have to do it forever, but try it. If you don't like it, try a different circle. Yeah. I couldn't agree more with all that. Um, so when you were at AAA, uh, did you present? I did. Yes. I have, this is a very busy presentation semester for me. It feels like I'm back in school a little bit, but I (laughs) presented at the vestibular grand rounds, which is exciting because it was two thirds students basically there. And there were a few hundred people. And I think that shows that students are valuing specializing in these little subset diagnostic aspects of the field. Cause that's, you know, really where I see the future heading. I think that if I were, if I were a student, if I were a uh, incoming audiologist, it makes so much sense to me to specialize in something yeah. because I think you'll gain the generalized experience undoubtedly one way or another. But I think that the specialty is like, that's kind of how you can future proof yourself, I feel like. And the other cool thing with it is like with vestibular in particular, I think that it would be, it seems really exciting that it feels like uncharted waters. Like there Mm -hmm. seems to be, as we were discussing with concussions, like there's a lot of space for this thing to evolve and take shape in ways that, you know, you're really starting to see in some of these specialized areas, the audiologist is totally becoming elevated uh, to a, to a, like a, a status alongside the, the greater medical professional community in a way that I feel like this is one of the most exciting opportunities, broadly speaking for audiology is elevating the profession to the minds of the cardiologists and the general physicians out there and the neurologists and all of these other allied medical professionals where they start to view an audiologist through a different lens than just the kind of the traditional status quo of like, well, aren't you the ones that deal with hearing aids? No, it's, it's much, much more than that. Yeah. And I think, you know, I've said this a lot, but dizziness is everywhere. Like one in three people who enter the ER have dizziness. And as soon as they roll out the big, scary stroke and, you know, heart stuff, they don't know what to do. So, you know, if you're in a environment where you haven't, or you're having challenges marketing to people, start with the ERs because they usually discharge people and say, you got vertigo as if that's a diagnosis. And we all know it's (laughs) not. Um, but there's a huge, huge opportunity and it's cool because you, I feel like the coolest moment is when a neurologist calls you and they're like, Hey, what do you think about this case? And it, it's really cool interprofessional. And that's why I like concussion. I'm working with optometrists, neurologists, you know, athletic trainers, physical therapists. It's really cool because I am right there with them. And they're asking me like, what do you think about this? And I'm asking them the same thing. And I, I think that is just a whole new level of elevating our profession and really operating at the top end of our degree. So with your program that you've helped develop within, you know, your, your practice, um, how has that been going? Obviously it sounds like it's going great, but I guess, you know, today versus even a year ago, like what are some of the changes? Because it does feel like it's just kind of fly by your seat of your pants a little bit and that it's just changing every single day. Yeah. So one huge issue with concussion evaluation in general from the vestibular side is there's no really dedicated research to say what protocol is appropriate. So that's still a developing process. I feel like the things that have changed the most are my protocol has changed. Um, And I think that's just as I'm learning what is really resonating and helping pick out people's symptoms the most. The other thing is the main neurologist that I work with here in town who sees most of the concussions originally he would send me patients after they've been through a round or two of physical therapy and then fail and still have dizziness. And I have been working really, really hard to be on the initial, you know, front side of that. And now I feel like he sends me the patients right away for evaluation to help direct treatment. Cause I, you know, what's really interesting about head injuries, especially in young populations, not everybody needs physical therapy. And I think that's kind of the automatic response for a lot of physicians is they will send straight to physical therapy and then find out what 
doesn't get better. And it's, you know, I am operating under the different thing that the more information we know up front, the better we can direct decisions on what they actually need. And most of the time it's not just physical therapy. So, so if it's not just physical therapy, what else would it entail? Um, so optometry is a big thing. There's a lot of eye related ocular motor issues, um, cognitive therapy through a speech therapist. Um, there's a high prevalence of anxiety, depression, or psychiatric changes. Obviously when people have a head injury and they can't go to work, they're not getting the money they're used to. They can't do their daily activities that it's a very understandable. Um, sometimes it's cardiologic changes post head injury. There's uh, quite a bit of information out of Mayo, Arizona about that. So, you know, there's a whole realm even neck related or back related issues that are causing dizziness. You know, there's a million different ways a patient could go. And sometimes I just see a patient track their abnormalities, bring them back a week later and things naturally recover because the brain naturally does want to rehab. So at that point, no intervention is needed, which saves, you know, everybody time and money. Yeah. So, okay. As we kind of come to the close here, yeah. this has been so interesting. I feel like, uh, I'm, I, I, there's so much more here that I would love to discuss with you at a later date, but, yeah. um, with the podcast, um, what are some of the highlights that you've had? Um, you know, both in terms of just doing the podcast, broadly speaking, but some of the topics that you've covered, I mean, what really stands out in your mind? So for me personally, I had mentioned earlier, having our physical therapist as a guest, I think was really amazing because, one thing that I didn't know much entering the field is really what happens once I send a patient out to vestibular rehab. I worked kind of on the outskirts with physical therapists, but never really been able to see what they do and hear what they do. So that's an incredible episode. If you just want to learn the basics of vestibular rehab, um, that's a really good one. We just released uh, the other day, it might've been yesterday, I'm not sure, um, ototoxicity. So when I was president of SA, we did this big survey for students and we found out that like two thirds of students don't have a dedicated pharmacology class. And I was one of those, like I, that's my, one of my weakest subsets of knowledge. So we had, um, another past president of SA, Riley DeBacker, who came on and he did his PhD in ototoxicity and kind of talked us through the basics of what to know, which was amazing for me personally. But, you know, I think I've learned something with every single episode we've like I said, covered everything from disorders to how to run certain tests and what to look for as an abnormality. So I think depending on what you want to learn about, you're going to be able to learn about it. I just think it's so cool. Um, Riley DeBacher, right? That's his yes. name. I just think it's so cool how, you know, this is the thing I like most about podcasts is that you really do start to kind of get a sense of who's who. I recognize him because he was on a This Week in Hearing episode and he was interviewed by Ashley Hughes mm -hmm. and they were talking about like collaborative negotiation and stuff like that. And so the, the point I'm making though is like uh, he made an impression on me with that episode and then I recognized him and I saw that he was on your episode. And so it just, again, kind of reinforces this whole point around personal brand building yeah. and understanding like who's who, you know, okay, so he's really heavy into the pharmacology ototoxicity space. That's mm -hmm. so interesting to me, knowing the different people that have really strong backgrounds in different areas. I just feel like you can really start to you can build up your knowledge tree of this space rather quickly just by identifying who the key experts are. And I mm -hmm. think, again, like that's the plug of why it's so important uh, as a young professional to just try to figure out, like, what do you want to be known for? When people think about you, what do you want that to be synonymous with? Um, it doesn't have to obviously be your whole identity, but I think like from a professional standpoint, there's so much value mm -hmm. there because it again allows for you to like just completely open doors and connect with people that are in similar fields and similar interests and then once you've done that even more doors start to open up so that's again just a yeah. massive plug for how important this whole brand building aspect of being a young professional is and most of us even riley like we all started with sa because that's a really you know low threshold low risk way to figure out what you like and what you like to do both within your field and you know outside of your specific subset we all started there that's probably where most of the people that i draw on on a daily basis are, are from yeah absolutely so cool um all right liz well for anybody who's interested in following up with you um where can they connect with you how can they find the podcast just a few more plugs for you 
Sure. Yeah. So our podcast is a dose of dizzy. You can find it anywhere you listen to your podcasts. It's on everything. Uh, we also have an Instagram and a Twitter. Uh, it's a dose of dizzy podcast and we try to post things, but I'm in charge of that and it doesn't always happen. <laughs> um, but yeah. And then you were connected through my personal Instagram on there. So you're welcome to find me, message me. Awesome. Well, that's been great. Thank you so much, Liz, for coming sure. on. Thanks for everybody who tuned in here to the end and we will chat with you next time. Thanks for tuning in today. I hope you enjoyed this episode of Future Ear Radio. For more content like this, just head over to futureear.co where you can read all the articles that I've been writing these past few years on the worlds of voice technology and hearables and how the two are beginning to intersect. Thanks for tuning in and I'll chat with you next time.